Good morning, everyone. Or should I say good afternoon? It's 12 o'clock. Um, I think we're going to get started here. Um, if there are any other people that will be logging on later, hopefully they'll, they'll join us. Um, for the sake of the presentation, I've muted um, everyone except for myself, just because it seems that when a bunch of us have our mics turned on, we get a lot of feedback and a lot of echoing. So um, if you have questions or, or comments, um, feel free to uh, type in the little chat box um, like Sherry's been doing, and that's a great way for me to um, uh, answer questions or kind of stop and maybe uh, or go back or, or explain something. Um, could you just kind of maybe give me a signal in the chat box if everyone can, can hear me okay and see my screen okay? Okay, great. So let me make my presentation bigger and we'll get started. So welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Erin Wilson and I am the project manager um, here for the New Brunswick Association for Community Living. Um, and today we'll be doing a lunch hour webinar on um, one of our newest uh, projects that we've been working on called the History in Action Project, um, which is a project that looks at the 150 years of inclusion in the province of New Brunswick. So thanks for everyone who's um, logged on. I'll also note that um, I'm recording the webinar so that we can upload it to our social media and to our website later on. Um, so if you miss something, um, don't worry, you can get a recorded copy of it. And it's also a great way for it to be shared um, with other uh, members of the community that didn't have a chance to participate today. So we're going to be talking about four big things um, over the next little while together. Um, I'll start by giving a little bit of some background information about the association. So the New Brunswick Association is a provincial nonprofit, um, and we support individuals who have an intellectual disability um, all across the lifespan, at all ages and stages, um, and milestones of life. So the association has been around for 60 years. Um, we were founded in 1957 by a group of parents, and this year marks our 60th anniversary, which is very exciting. So that is a big reason why we wanted to do this project, um, is to really kind of highlight our history and document it. Another big reason why we wanted to do the project was because um, we are a grassroots movement that was started by parents. Um, and parents have been a driving force within our, our movement um, and continue to be. So we really wanted to highlight the power of parents um, and let people know that parents are very powerful voices for their children and can move mountains and advocate. A big reason why we also want to do this project is because uh, exclusion and segregation and institutionalization have a very long history in New Brunswick. Um, and as the saying goes, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So we wanted to raise awareness um, about this history so that we don't see any um, backsliding done towards some of the mistakes that have happened in the past. Um, and on top of it being our 60th year, the project also went a little bit further than that and decided to look at the full 150 years of how people with an intellectual disability living in New Brunswick um, uh, have been treated and lived in society. So we were lucky enough to get um, some funding to do this particular project from the New Horizons for Seniors, uh, which is a federal program that exists under the uh, Employment and Social uh, Development Canada uh, Department, which is great. And so you can see we've been doing this project for a little while, and this month is actually the final month of the project, which is really great. So um, afterwards, I'll ask for um, uh, your contact info, and I just have a short uh, little evaluation to send around um, so that uh, we can kind of gauge how much knowledge you've learned um, versus what you knew before the presentation and, and what you knew after. 
So, like I had said, community living um, started in 1957 as a grassroots movement by parents. So it was very organic. Um, it was uh, parents who had a child or children with an intellectual disability. Um, and at that time in New Brunswick, uh, children with an intellectual disability and cerebral palsy were not allowed to attend public schools. So parents um, wanted more than that for their children um, and they banded together and started forming um, groups of parents and started to form a collective voice so that they could advocate on behalf of their of their children to be more included. So this is um, the community living movement is really a story uh, with parents at the heart of it. They um, they started the movement. They were the leaders of the movement um, uh, during the times of the 1950s and 60s and 70s, and really are responsible for a tremendous amount of um, programs and kind of social services infrastructure uh, that now exist in the province that didn't exist before the community living the community living movement started, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. So. You'll hear firsthand from a number of uh, parents, um, what I'll call trailblazer parents. So these are parents um, who had a son or daughter with an intellectual disability um, that helped found the movement during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So there are video clips embedded within the presentation where you'll hear um, their firsthand account of what it was like um, for their son or daughter and for their family. And um, these trailblazer parents uh, are um, aging, obviously. So um, it's it was really, really important for us to try to capture as much of their oral history so that we could um, document it. So this is um, an old photo, I believe from the 1960s. Um, so because we were a grassroots movement, a lot of the work that was done by parents um, happened in church basements, in living rooms, in community centers, um, in kind of really uh, small beginnings. Um, so this is a picture of a number of uh, parents at the time. Um, and the gentleman in the black tie on the left-hand side is Les Hull, um, who was a politician at the time. Um, so this is them having a, a meeting with Les Hull um, in what looks to be a very modest um, church basement. <laughs> So I love this picture because it demonstrates our kind of humble beginnings, but um, how powerful uh, we were at lobbying. So our history as a as a as a movement wasn't really captured or written down anywhere. Um, we had kind of uh, piecemeal things like some pictures here and there or some policies um, here and there, but there was no kind of um, comprehensive timeline um, that existed about the association. So we wanted to be able to fix that as much as possible with this project. And like I said earlier, if we, if we don't know our past, we're doomed to repeat it. So we have learned many, many valuable lessons from exclusion and segregation over the last 60 years um, in New Brunswick. And without awareness and, and conversation and dialogue about that history, um, there's a real fear that we'll see a lot of backwards movement um, towards segregation and towards exclusion. So we wanted to capture that history as much as possible because we find that a lot of people just don't know it. Um, and that, like any social movement or any human rights movement or social justice movement, um, there really has to be constant vigilance. Um, you have to stay on top of things. You have to be, um, you know, on your game and, and, and know, your, know your stuff. Um, otherwise, there could very easily be some backwards movement. So we don't want to try... Uh, exclusion or segregation again, because we've done that, we've tried it, we know it doesn't work. So a big part about this project was making sure that people actually know that history um, and know that it didn't work, so we don't try to repeat it again. So um, this is our lovely 60th anniversary logo. 
Um, so we were founded in 1957 on April 10th. Um, and just uh, earlier this month, we had our uh, 60th anniversary um, event on April 10th. So we were we were to the day, 60 years, celebrating. And so this year we have a number of events and trainings and projects like this one that we'll be um, talking about around the province in different communities to try to highlight um, our 60 years strong. And then um, coming very soon um, in the summertime, we are going to be releasing an online resource that will document the 150-year timeline um, of people with an intellectual disability in New Brunswick. Um, so this is very exciting. It's going to have its own website, its own online resources, like an ebook. Um, it'll have a downloadable PDF with lots of pictures, and um, it'll be very interactive. So be on the lookout for that. Um, it, like I say, it should be it should be happening sometime this summer, and it will be publicized through uh, through our website and our social media channels, and um, and all of that good stuff. And so that particular um, project uh, of the online resources, and I'm going around and sharing those online resources, we were lucky enough to get Canada 150 money uh, to complete that particular project. So like any uh, social justice movement, um, community living has gone through different waves and stages of development and progress. So when we talk about the first wave of the community living movement, um, we're talking about the kind of 1950s and 1960s. So this is where we wanted to see a shift from total exclusion in, uh, to uh, a form of uh, segregated supports. So a really good example is that um, at that time, if you had an intellectual disability or cerebral palsy and you were a child, you were totally excluded from the public school system. Um, and during that time, um, it was because the government uh, had deemed that children who had an intellectual disability um, couldn't benefit from an education. There was no point. Um, so there was that push from parents to get that education for their children. And at the beginning, that took on the form of segregated auxiliary classes. So these were special schools that were started outside of existing schools um, in various communities all around the province. So not what we would want for today, but at that time, that was um, the direction of the movement. And then when we talk about the second wave of the community living movement, um, it, the word integration kind of sums it up. So if we stick with our school example, integration would be um, an outside special school um, being brought into a regular school. So then we, we would see the emergence of um, special education classes inside regular schools. So this is when we'd be looking at in the 1970s or 1980s, well, early 1980s. So um, children who had an intellectual disability were attending regular schools, but they were in a classroom all by themselves with a teacher. So they weren't included in the larger um, regular classrooms and very often weren't included in extracurricular activities um, that went along with school life, um, like dances and clubs and, you know, um, field trips and things like that. So then we get to the third wave of the community living movement, um, which we're in presently which has been happening since the late 80s up until now approximately. Um, and this is the inclusion wave. So this is where we want to see, um, if we're still thinking about schools, children um, who have an intellectual disability being included in the regular classroom with their peers um, in their local neighborhood with the appropriate supports. So there's no type of distinction between um, different spaces uh, for people who have a disability and people who don't have a disability. Um, there's a real uh, push and value for that inclusion to be happening um, on all levels. 
So that's a little bit of, of uh, some background on the different types of waves that, um, that we've experienced as a movement. So along with these waves, um, the attitude and treatment of New Brunswickers who have had an intellectual disability has evolved and changed over time the same way our movement has. So um, if we look way, way back into the 1800s, which we'll see when our brand new timeline um, gets released online later this summer, um, there have been many different attitudes towards folks, ranging from charity to um, people being seen as um, simple-minded or feeble-minded or childlike, and then um, people being seen as a menace uh, to society. And so throughout all of this, these attitudes um, and treatments that have kind of shifted over time, there's a long history of institutionalization that has gone along with it. So this picture here on this slide is um, what we would know kind of in present day as center care, which existed in St. John that shut down in 1998. Um, but it was around in some form or another for about 100 years. And so at this time, when, when this picture was taken, it was known as the Lunatic Asylum. Um, so it's a very scary thing to think about um, asylums and institutions um, because they're not um, good places, but there's a long, a long history of them. So they've looked different in New Brunswick throughout time. So some of them have taken on the form of almshouses or poor houses. Um, so these would be kind of like um, charity houses that were run maybe by a church um, or some sort of uh, community um, where people uh, maybe who were homeless or had disabilities um, were, were congregated together. Um, some of them were work houses where individuals were expected to kind of work um, hard labor to earn their keep. Um, jails have also been used um, a long time ago as a form of um, housing for, for folks who have an intellectual disability, and then asylums. Um, so if you look at this slide here, the very top picture is the St. John Alms House in, in 1843. Um, it's that first building on the left with the pile of bricks out front as it's being built. And then the one underneath, um, in 1900, you can see it's a way more buildings, so it uh, it went through quite quite a growth. So um, we're going to kind of zoom ahead now to the 1930s and the 1950s. So this is when we start to see those parent groups that I was speaking about earlier really start to form on a in a on a formal basis um, and start to organize themselves. So within the, U the U.S., um, there was an organization that's now called the ARC. It was formed in 1950. And so this was a parent group that worked on behalf of people with an intellectual disability. And in the 1950s, in, Fred in, or in um, New Brunswick, excuse me, we started to see local parent groups in, in cities and towns all across the province start to pop up, um, usually with the focus on education and supports for their children. And by 1957, all of those local associations, so in Woodstock and Fredericton and Bathurst and Campbellton, um, they decided that they needed to come together um, as a group to form a, a provincial uh, organization. Um, because they felt that with a provincial federation, they would have a much stronger voice so that they could advocate on behalf of their, on behalf of their children. So that's when we, when we came into existence. It was 1957, um, April 10th. So as we started to move into the 1960s, um, we started to see a bit of an expansion of services. So prior to this, um, 
parents um, who had a child with an intellectual disability um, were often told um, or pressured um, to uh, have their children placed in institutions, um, didn't feel that they could ever be educated or benefit from an education, um, and it was a very um, tough time on top of that because there were no real formalized um, services uh, or supports, uh, government or otherwise, that existed for parents. So if a parent decided to keep their child in the family home, um, they were really doing it by themselves. So in the 1960s, that started to change a bit. Um, you'll see through it the presentation, it's really kind of small steps um, happened in order to get to the point where we are today. So community residences started to be formed during this time um, all around the province. So these were um, congregated housing um, group homes that were there as an alternative to some of the large-scale institutions that existed um, for, for people at that time. Um, and a number of those were started and run by local associations um, all around the province. Again, this is the first wave, so some sort of segregated or congregated um, service was what um, the go-to move was for parents at that time because nothing existed at all. So they were just looking for anything that would, uh, that would suit their, their children. So not what we would hope for today, 60 years later, we wouldn't hope for congregated or segregated living, uh, but that's what was happening in the 1960s. So um, during that time as well, we started to see these segregated auxiliary classes um, and schools popping up all around the province. Because at that time, like I had said earlier, the Department of Education in New Brunswick had said that it would not take on the responsibility for educating children who had an intellectual disability or cerebral palsy. So um, there's a, a, a trailblazer senior parent here in Fredericton um, that was around during this time and always tells the story of uh, the local Fredericton parent group banding together, um, buying a plot of land clearing it themselves and building a school for their children and then having yard sales and rummage sales to raise money to pay the salary of the teacher that they would go on to hire to educate their children. And they had uh, the local firefighters, volunteer firefighters, help build the school. And then the parents themselves became the actual kind of like janitorial cleaner staff to make sure that the school was continued to be clean and kind of kept up. So they went to incredible lengths to um, start schools so that their children could receive some sort of um, education, um, which is pretty incredible to think about. So a little bit later, um, we saw the uh, Auxiliary Classes Act come into being. So this is where the, um, the province kind of took a tiny step further, um, saying they wouldn't support children within the regular school, but they would at least develop an act that would um, govern how all of these auxiliary schools and classes should be run. So it was very common for parents of these children to still want their child to attend the regular um, neighborhood school. Um, but that wasn't an option, so they would have applied to these segregated schools. But all along the way, they would be continuing to advocate um, for their children to be in the um, regular school system. So they kind of had a foot, um, you know, a foot in each world in the segregated world, as well as pushing for the inclusive world. So in the 1970s, we start to see this focus on integration happen. So remember, integration um, is kind of defined as uh, a, a regular school 
but that children with an intellectual disability would exist within a special education class within that school and not benefit from seeing their, their peers or having recess together or going on field trips or, or anything like that. They were very much um, closed off from the rest of the school community. So this is the first video um, that I'm going to show. And this is um, a senior parent by the name of Diane. Um, and Diane has two children um, who have an intellectual disability. And she tells in this video uh, the story of how her son, Rob, who is older, went through his entire schooling segregated. And then his, and then her younger daughter, Lynn, um, go through high school um, in an inclusive uh, classroom. And you can hear the, um, the benefits. And I'm going to play this. And if you can't hear it, please please send me a, a message in the chat and I'll, and I'll try to fix the problem. When it was time for them to go to school, in our community there was segregated schools and I decided that's not where my children should go and I enrolled them in regular, in a regular school. And um, for my son, who's 50, for the first two years of school he was in a regular class. And then they put him in a special education class, which is a segregated class in the school. And he went through all this, well, he went through his whole schooling in that separate class. My daughter started out in the separate class, but when she got to high school, it just happened that's when the laws changed. And they were talking about children with intellectual disabilities needing to be included with all of the other children. Um, so that's when Lynn went through her high school in um, a regular classroom with everyone else. And you know what? The other day I was at a carnival at the high school where my daughter and my son graduated. And I went and looked at my son's graduation picture. It's a big group. There were, there were three or four hundred children. And he was sitting way over on the side, apart from all of the kids. All of the kids were in a big, big group. And he was over on the side. Lynn, who was, remember I said she went in high school, she was in a regular classroom, she was in the middle of the group. It was like, the picture showed it. It showed it that he was really separate yeah. and she belonged. She was right in the middle of it. So his face is sad in his picture. Her face, she's beaming. So I almost like those two pictures. <laughs> I, I didn't have my camera with me to take a picture of it, but I should have, because it like it really exactly shows to me how important it is for children who have a disability to be with other kids. And when they are, the other kids want them with them. Because they didn't have to bring Lynn out to take that picture. And they did. It was an informal picture, eh? It was like they were all outside and uh, they do that. They, it's not a grad picture, it's just like Let's get together and have a picture of Ty. And they, they made sure she was there, and they made sure she was in the middle of them. So to me, it's, it showed how important it was that um, we include people so that they can be just part of regular day life with everyone else. So, so that's Diane giving us a little bit. Um, of, uh, of insight about how it was for, um, for her children. So I'm hoping that everyone heard that. Okay. So this next um, video is Diane again talking about uh, schooling um, and how all the kind of good things that, that go along with being included um, in school with your peers. Because I think what they need to understand is that um, the school is more than just about, uh, it is about learning, of course. I mean, I went to school, I actually am a school teacher. Yeah, school is about learning, it's about getting an education. But it's also more than that. It's also about learning how to make friends, it's about learning how to be in community. It's about learning how to participate, how to contribute, how to be a leader. That all happens within our school systems. It happens in our sports teams, in our clubs, in our societies, right? the, all the different social activities. It happens in the, at the dances that they hold, 
all of that. So to me, it's so important that the, our, our sons and daughters, children like my son and daughter, have, are part of that whole life. And they can't just be in one piece of it. They can't be, oh, well, we'll make sure they're there for the dance. Uh, but if, if, they're, if we do that, then we're treating them special and different. And the, no one's going to know them at the dance. <laughs> you know, so. So I love that because it really clearly highlights the difference between inclusion and integration. Um, that you can't just kind of, it's not good enough to just have a classroom in the school. Um, you really have to be involved in all parts of the school, um, which is so important to what inclusion is all about. So the 1980s um, in New Brunswick were very, very busy uh, when it comes to um, the community living movement. So within the timeline that will be coming out soon, there'll be a little bit more detail, um, but for our purposes here today, we'll, we'll look at a couple of them. So um, a very big thing that happened um, in the St. John region is that the Dr. William F. Roberts Hospital School was closed in um, 1985. So for folks who aren't familiar, that was a very large scale um, institution for children. Um, so it was a psychiatric children's facility. And I think at its peak, it had around a thousand children um, living in it. So these were children that when they had been born, their parents had received a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, from doctors and society in general to give up their child um, and to place their child in, um, in a large-scale institution. So I've got a, a wonderful video here um, of two uh, senior parents themselves. This is Irma and Peter. So they themselves have a daughter with an intellectual disability. Um, and when their daughter was growing up, they were pressured uh, to put her in an institution, but they didn't. They kept her at home. And in the 1980s, uh, Irma and Peter were actually employed by the association. And so the association was very involved um, behind the scenes doing a lot of, you know, kind of um, advocating to close this institution. And Irma and Peter were responsible for um, planning directly with a number of folks so that they could move back into community and back into um the parents' homes. So this is Irma and Peter talking about, about that time. So then you two were par a par part of the movement of deinstitutionalization, both with the Roberts School and with the school in Newfoundland as well. Yeah. Wow. In the Roberts School, we didn't it was already moving forward quite a bit, so our particular involvement was actually fairly minimal. Mm -hmm. It was already moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So what kind of, maybe walk me through that, that time um, of, the, of the Robert School being in existence, and then obviously there was a lot of pressure for it to be shut down, and so who, who was kind of involved with that? Well, the association had been very much involved on a political level, and it was Nancy Parti, and, and she supported community-based services. Our, our role really was to some parents who had young adults living at the Roberts School. Um, we met with parents to try to sort of encourage them, pave the way with the one to see that in terms of planning for Yeah, to help them plan. Help them plan. And so that was actually our role. And we did meet with parents. Um, but the government wasn't ready to move people out of the broader school while we were with the association that happened after, I guess, a few years after we closed. Mm -hmm. They closed in yeah. mm -hmm. Pretty much yeah. Yeah. a year after. It was about a year after. So, so when you were planning with the parents and the individuals who are getting ready to move out of the hospital into community, like what what kind of what did the planning look like? Like what were you guys hoping to achieve for those folks? It was basically to find out if they were willing to have their son or daughter 
come and live back in their family home with the support that they needed. Um, I think at that time they were still teenagers, so it seemed appropriate that, that they would be able to live. But many parents said that they it just took them back to the years when they struggled on their own and couldn't get supports. And they were fearful that if their ch child came back home again, that the government would renege and then they would be back to where they were before and they weren't willing to go through that pain again. Right. And so we had to basically encourage them that government was serious and with the support of the association that was advocating on their behalf mm -hmm. that the supports would be there and um, yeah, even though they weren't there before. So do you remember how, about how many, like the number of families that you would have worked with to do that transition planning? Um, in that case, there were, I think, about three families in particular, okay. and it was fairly intensive. I imagine to work with those particular families. Okay. So it, the numbers weren't large because mm -hmm. they were already starting to break. But these, these were some families who had been the most difficult in the past to get the help they were, they were ready to. To, to get that kind of so yeah. go through that again. So, so what did it mean to the community, the community living movement in New Brunswick when the Roberts School shut down? Do you think? Like, what did that, what did that symbolize? I guess for the greater movement. Well, for one thing, it was a shift of resources from the institution to community resources and even even there, often the the funding is. Technically, it's supposed to be community support, but they're flowing into many institutions. So, yeah. so um, Irma and Peter are very incredible people. Um, so they helped to shut down the uh, Roberts Hospital School in St. John, and then um, they traveled back to Newfoundland, where they had been living previously. Um, because the community living movement in Newfoundland needed help shutting down their large-scale um, children's institution. So they went back uh, to help um, the other province shut down their institution. And in fact, it was the exact same institution that they had been pressured to put their daughter into um, when she was just 16 months old. So um, they are uh, incredible uh, trailblazers um, as well as their daughter. So in the 1980s, another big thing that happened um, in New Brunswick was we saw inclusive education become a reality. So in 1986, Bill 85 was introduced. And so this was the bill um, that would legislate um, inclusive education among all schools in New Brunswick. So what that meant was that children who had an intellectual disability and cerebral palsy um, had the right to attend um, their regular um, neighborhood school and attend the regular classroom with their peers, so not a special education um, or a classroom, and to have supports um, available for them to, uh, make that, to make that schooling happen. So from 1957, until 1986, um, it took a long, long, long time to get that education um, legislation passed. Um, but it, it happened because of the association and because of uh, parents um, who were advocating. So this is Joy Bacon. Um, the, uh, she is a former board president for um, the New Brunswick Association for Community Living, um, and she is the current president of the Canadian Association for Community Living. Um, and she um, is talking about the importance of um, Bill 85 and all the good things that happened when it, uh, when it was introduced. Eventually, over time, the Australians in the mid 80s uh, have been, uh, which took a stand in for genuinely inclusive education, which we are still working with today. It all begins with education, whether you have an intellectual disability or whether you don't. So much of what is able, we're able to 
do, what happens with us in our later lives is determined by that educational base that we have. We learn uh, our socialization. We learn, we learn much more than hard facts and numbers in the education system. We learn how to socialize. We learn how to interact with other people. We make the connections that stay with us um, often in one way or another, even if the actual connection, the experience of making connections, making friends, um, is, it becomes it becomes part of what we know and how we operate in our lives. So it's a really, really important base from where we go. From how we, from, I guess, where we move forward. Um, so in 1986, we saw um, inclusive education come come into being, um, and like Joy said, there's um, it's not uh, fully perfect, but um, it's uh, it's there. And New Brunswick is one of the real trailblazers um, for inclusive education. We were one of the first in in the country um, to to have this. Um, come into being. And New Brunswick has actually won a number of international awards uh, celebrating our inclusive education system since then. So another very important thing that happened in the 1980s um, is that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was um, became part of the Canadian Constitution. So this is the piece of um, law that protects us against discrimination based on race, religion, sex, age, uh, color, physical or mental disability. So in 1980, um, when this piece of um, law was being worked on, uh, it became very obvious that mental disability was not going to be included. So the legislators pl certainly planned on including physical disability, uh, but they had no plans to include mental disability as one of the protected classes. So that would have had huge effects on, on people who had an intellectual disability. So in 1980, um, MBACL actually sent a brief um, to the special committee uh, that was formulating the charter, um, strongly advocating for mental disability to be included. Um, and it was, eventually. Um, so it's it's there now, and it's been there ever since the charter um, was created and released. So this was a huge turning point because this now meant that there was a piece of law that um, prohibited discrimination against people just because they had an intellectual disability. So this gave people an enormous amount of protection um, that they had never experienced before. Um, so parents that I've spoken to really see this as a huge turning point um, in their children uh, being valued uh, by, by Canadian society. Um, in New Brunswick as well, in, in 1982, um, MBACL um, launched the first pilot of the Early Intervention Program. So this happened in Fredericton, uh, the local Fredericton Association for Community Living. Um, a number of parents um, got a meeting with Les Hall, who was uh, within the education uh, department at the time, um, and literally took their children with them to the meeting with Les Hall and told them and told Les Hall that, you know, there needed to be um, a proactive outreach early intervention program and would he fund it. <laughs> so um, they got the money to pilot it and this program kind of grew and grew and grew so that eventually it was a program that was taken on by the Department of Education and has gone on to benefit many many children not just children who have an intellectual disability. So I love that. That was something that I myself didn't know about um, the association when I started working here, that it was responsible in the 80s for the very first early intervention program um, that subsequently kind of grew into a, a whole provincial-wide uh, program. So in the 1990s, we see a real kind of shift um, thinking about people living in community. So in 1998, uh, center care um, is closed. 
So Center Care, it was a massive institution um, in the St. John region. This is a picture of it on the right-hand side. So it was kind of perched on the hill over top of the reversing falls. And at its peak in 1956, it had 1,700 patients um, living there. And so conditions within this uh, institution were um, not good. There were, there's lots of documentation of um, people being chained to their beds, people being malnourished, um, people being um, uh, abused by staff, and it, uh, there are a number of people that we support now as an association that actually spent time in center care, and um, some of the stories are quite, quite traumatizing. So it was closed, um, and even at the time that it was closed, in the mid-90s, there were still 50 people who were living there. Um, and, you know, 97, 98, that's not that long ago, um, really, in the grand scheme of things, um, to think about that something like that was still in existence uh, in New Brunswick. So this is... Um, I'll, I'll tell you about the picture first. This is a, a picture that I, I got from a, a parent. Um, and this is a brick from the rubble of center care. So when center care was demolished, because it's no longer standing, they, they bulldozed it to the ground, and it's now a park um, that overlooks the reversing falls. So this is a brick that a, that a parent went and scooped up um, and, uh, and kept as a, as a reminder of, of, of the place. And there are two champagne glasses <laughs> um, on either side uh, so that people could celebrate. So this was a really big moment um, for the community living movement uh, in New Brunswick. So this symbolized a whole bunch of things, um, one of which was people being moved back into community. So um, going maybe back to the family home, maybe going into their own home, um, or some sort of congregated living. And so along with that, there was also a major shift in resources um, so that um, before all of the kind of money and funding had been going towards these large institutions, um, that funding could now be uh, diverted and shifted to community programs and community supports. So it, didn't, so it wasn't just, you know, people who were leaving these institutions that could benefit from these programs. It was the entire community, really. So it's important to talk about institutions of the past, but it's also important to talk about them today because um, they still exist uh, in New Brunswick. Maybe not on such a large scale as Center Care, the 1,700 bed facility, uh, but this is Diane again um, talking about her experience with institutions um, over the last 30 or so years in New Brunswick. I guess that institutions still exist today because institutions are not four walls. I really, an institution is how you treat people. Um, I have to say, though, I did walk into one institution where people with indi individuals who had physical disabilities and intellectual disabilities were housed. And that would have been in the 1980s. And when I walked into the room, it was a room the size of a gym. It was large. And um, people were all around sitting in chairs, some in wheelchairs, some of them not. And some of them had their hands tied down to their tables. Some of them had uh, jackets on them so that they couldn't move their hands. It was the, the thing that struck me the most is that when I looked at the people that were all around that room, they were my, they were like bloggers and Lynn, they were like my son and my daughter. And I couldn't understand how come they were there. Because they were young. I'm not talking people that were in their 30s and 40s. I'm talking the people that were teenagers and even younger. And I couldn't understand. I know they were there because families probably couldn't take care of them. They didn't have the means to. Physically, maybe, didn't have the need to. I'm sure it was a good reason. But um, they 
was heartbreaking for me to walk in that room and to see all of those young boys and girls sitting around, all around this big, big, big room. And the staff was off in a corner somewhere behind the boss door. I, and I couldn't, I, I walked out of there and I cried all the way on. Because it was, it was terrible. Now I have to tell you something. Not long ago, I also went into an institution, a nursing home. And it was way prettier. The entrance was beautiful. It had a beautiful fireplace. It was pretty on the walls. Everything was beautiful. And I left there crying too. Because I saw people the same age as my son and daughter in their 40s who didn't want to be there. And the only reason why they were there is they didn't have support to be able to live in their own home, in their own apartment. And so when I left there, I cried. Because maybe we don't have the institutions that were here that looked, they were not nice looking, but you can still have nice looking, <laughs> it doesn't make it better. Pretty doesn't make it better. It's still a horrible place to be where you're not at home, where you can't choose what you put on your wall, how many pictures you put on your wall where you can't choose what you have for dinner, where you can't choose what you do in the afternoon, where you can't choose what time you go to bed, where you can't choose what time you get up, where you need to wear a diaper because they don't have time to put you on the bathroom, even though you're not incompetent. So that's still existing today. Not 1980, 2017, and I think that's horrendous, which no one should live that. So I know a woman who's, I know two women, in fact, who are in their early 40s that are living that. And the only reason they're there is because they can't get the kind of support they would need to live in their own apartment. And they don't know how to go and get the support. So they need associations like an adventure association who can help them, who can work with them, can figure out how to help them realize that dream of going back to their own apartment and living in their own apartment. It's the kind of support they need. And it's very, very possible because my children, that's what, that's what they have. And it's they have a good life because of it. So, um, they, I mean, I think it's important for us to know that I, oftentimes we can talk about institutions as a thing of the past, um, but the institutional mindset um, is still present uh, today in New Brunswick. And I think the last time um, I had spoken about it with someone. Uh, I think there's roughly around 350 individuals who are under the age of 60 currently living in nursing homes around the province uh, because of some sort of physical or intellectual disability. Um, and like Diane said, because they, they haven't been able to secure the supports necessary for them to stay in their own home or to live in their own home in the first place. So in the 2000s, we see... Um, some really great policy start to happen, a lot of really great social policy. So we see the Disability Support Program um, be piloted in 2005. And so that's a program that still exists today. So that's um, a program for uh, adults, 19 to 64, um, who have some sort of a, a long-term disability that are living in New Brunswick and some sort of unmet need. Um, so it's a, it's a, um, a program run by the government that folks can apply to to receive funding for different supports. So prior to this, there was really a one-size-fits-all approach um, to supporting and funding uh, funding supports for folks who had a disability um, living in New Brunswick. 
So it went, it shifted from a one size fits all um, to a very individualized process where plans were different from person to person. Um, so this is a huge, huge shift um, because it really symbolized that people with a disability had a tremendous amount of choice um, and ability to uh, tailor their supports uh, to meet their own needs and their own kind of goals for the future. Um, so I'm conscious of our time. Um, we still only have five minutes left, so um, we'll, we'll skip this video for now, but you can find it on the um, MBACL uh, YouTube channel. And this is Diane talking about how those individualized supports made it possible for her children, Lynn and Rob, to live in their own home um, rather than moving into a nursing home. So in the 2010s, um, full citizenship becomes the real uh, goal and focus. So in 2010, Canada ratified the United Nations Convention on, on the Rights of Persons with a Disability. So this is a piece of international um, legislation that um, kind of lays out standards for countries about how to meet the most basic human rights and needs of people who have a disability. And this includes right to a right to life, community participation, decision making, education and employment. Um, and in 2016, just last year, Canada signed on for the optional protocol of this convention, um, which means that if um, a person with a disability kind of goes through all the channels in Canada to try to um, uh, fix a, a, um, some form of discrimination that they're facing and it doesn't work, um, we, they can now appeal directly to the convention's committee. Um, rather than just kind of being stuck um, dealing with something here in the country. So there's a, a lot of oversight um, that uh, and accountability that is now in place, which is great. So another big focus um, that we see in the 2010s is uh, employment. Um, so in New Brunswick, 70% um, of adults who have an intellectual disability are either unemployed or underemployed. Um, so this is a huge um, problem for folks because when you don't have a job, you can't earn enough money to live on your own, make your own decisions, um, buy your own things. You, you become very dependent on other people and the system. Um, so this has been a big focus for the association and for um, really associations across the country, uh, pushing for equal work, for equal pay. Um, so that people can um, earn a wage. Um, and it's a really big way that we value people um, is if people can work and can contribute and participate. Um, so this is a big, a big uh, new initiative um, that is happening right now, which is very exciting. So again, this is Joy talking about um, employment, uh, but we'll skip it for now because we only have two minutes left. But like I say, it's on our YouTube channel um, if you'd like to go and watch it. So um, this is the, the kind of end. Um, I'm hoping that it wasn't too rushed. There's so much content to go through. And of course, this isn't all the content over the last 60 years. Obviously, we'd need way more than an hour to do that. Um, but I just want to thank everyone for participating and um, if there are any questions feel free to um, to type them um, and I think um, I have the email addresses for both of you which is great so I'll be able to send along um, the evaluation forms so I would very much appreciate it if you would take the time to fill those out and send them back to me. Our funder is um, keen to know um, and gauge the level of knowledge uh, before and afterwards. So, um, <laughs> oh, that's good. So it looks like uh, there are no questions for now, um, but um, you know I'm available later if people if people have questions. So we'll end it there. Um, so thank you so much for um, for participating and be on the lookout for our our online resources that will be launched um, later this summer, so you can get an even deeper sense of uh, of the history. So thank you very much.